from a man I used to know Every day we'd share a laugh and talk of the Lord But now the Lord has taken him back home Leaving me with only memories I miss him so Our friend in the Lord Is like no other friend Because he shares your love for God And builds your faith in him Thank the Lord your God For those he's given you You call your friend in the Lord. He lifts you up in sorrow and gives it to you straight. He helps you face tomorrow and always gives you grace. Yes, his love for you is unconditional. Yes, his love for you is unconditional. We fellowshiped in the house of the Lord, wondering what it'd be like to be with the Lord. Singing, I can only imagine, like two fools. Reminding one another it won't be long And shouting out amen as we go His love for you is unconditional. Yes, his love for you is unconditional. Praise be the Lord who gives and who takes. And I will wait for the day the Lord takes me home. The day is soon approaching, this I know And then I'll see my friend in the Lord A friend in the Lord is like no other friend Because he shares your love for God And builds your faith in Him
Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11, verse 1? Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. Um, last evening, we presented an overview of chapter 11. And uh, in, in that overview, we noted that verse 1 of chapter 11 uh, actually goes with verse 21 of Daniel chapter 10. So we'll be noting that uh, reason why here this evening. So therefore, uh, because we did the the overview of chapter 11, uh, this is kind of a, a, a little bit of a digression here this evening by noting verse 1, because verse 1 actually goes uh, with uh, Daniel chapter 10. So uh, without further ado, let's, as, our, as is our custom, let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves. Uh, this involves examining ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. The Holy Spirit will take the, during this time of silent a moment of silence, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, we can be alone with God and the Holy Spirit will convict us of any sins and therefore we confess those sins that he brings to our remembrance and then this restores us to fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit and both of which of course are maintained by our obedience to the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us to study your word, to learn of your plan for our lives, to learn of your plan for planet Earth, and to learn about your character and nature, and thus the character and nature of both your Son and the Spirit. We just thank you, Father, for everyone that is here this evening, both in the Thompson household and those on the internet, on Pal Talk. Uh, watching this class through our website. We thank you for each and every one of them. We also like to thank you for raising up Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us so that we can teach the Word of God on a con consistent basis. We thank you for Titus's work with the sound and the recordings. We pray that you give him wisdom in that area. We thank you for the technology. And we just pray this evening that you would help the communicator to speak clearly and concisely and accurately your word to communicate to your people your full counsel, help your people to understand what's being taught and to make application. And uh, we just pray that as a result that not only your people would be built up and edified spiritually through this hour alone with you, but also that you would, your son Jesus Christ would be glorified. So Father, we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Daniel chapter 11 verse 1 is, is, a, is our subject here this evening. As I mentioned before the opening prayer, we had an overview, we presented an overview of chapter 11, and uh, of course we noted in that overview that verse 1 of this chapter actually goes with verse 10. I think the net Bible is, uh, that I know of off the top of my head actually points this out, uh, that this verse 1 is actually related to verse 10. I, I might be wrong on that, but I think that's what the, the case is. Uh, and they mention in their notes. Now, uh, the reason that is, and I'm going to show you this evening, is, is the statement does belong with ver uh, chapter 10. If you're going to break it out, of course, the original languages, they didn't have the, 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 you know, the, the uh, verse markings, the chapter divisions and all that. That was uh, back in the 1500s, that was uh, done, or maybe even earlier, and it wasn't the original autographs. But uh, it's clear that the, the thought, the preparation for Daniel's uh, receiving this revelation in the final two chapters uh, is actually verse 1 of chapter 11 goes with that, that, that pa previous paragraph that's recorded in chapter 10, uh, which presents Daniel's preparation to receive this great revelation that's found in Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, all the way to the end of the book. So uh, what's interesting about uh, what we're going to see here this evening with verse 1 of chapter 11 is, uh, is that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, statement by the angel, we're going to see the angel speaking here in verse 1, which is quite unique, I think, in Scripture, uh, and we see here that he actually talks about, uh, this angel talks about helping Michael uh, when, in, in a, in a, uh, during the first year of Darius's reign, 
uh, Darius the Mede, his first re- year of reign over Babylon. And uh, he t- and now, so basically in verse 1, he's going to say that, uh, and, and, well, we noted in Daniel 10, 21, the angel said that uh, Michael came to help him during the third year of Cyrus the Persian's reign. Now in chapter 11, verse 1, this angel sp- that was speaking to Daniel, he says, well, he says, Michael, I, can't, I went to help Michael during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. So they helped each other, though Michael was uh, in higher authority than this angel. Now what's interesting here is that we're going to talk about, well, why would, uh, why would uh, Michael need uh, his, uh, this angel's assistance during the first year Darius the Medes' reign? And we're going to have to take a little uh, look at chapters 5 and 6, in particular chapter 6, in the book of Daniel, and there's some, uh, what's presented there to us will tell us, and if we compare this with other passages of scripture which says that the devil is seeking to destroy Israel and the Jewish people, if we, if we look at, compare that passage with what's found in chapter 6 and what this angel says in chapter 11 verse 1, we see that uh, Daniel was being attacked by the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of darkness was using those men who worked with him in Darius the Medes government, as we saw in chapter 6, that conspired to put Daniel to death or have the king issue a decree that would result in Daniel's death. Satan was instigating that, and we know that because of the inference from Scripture. We compare Scripture to Scripture. The angel was trying to kill Daniel because he, Daniel was the, a, 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 a person that God used as a buffer, as we brought this out in chapter 6. He was a buffer between the, 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 the great kings of Babylon, like Nebuchadnezzar and Persia, and, and, and uh, like Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. He served as a buffer between the Jewish people in Babylon that were exiled in Babylon and these great kings, these Gentile heathen kings. So Daniel, by getting Daniel out of the way, the kingdom of darkness would have free reign in destroying the Jewish people. That's what I believe is going on. You can, we, we'll look at this this evening, and you tell me what you, you could th- come to your own decisions about what you think is, if, if I've presented enough evidence about this. I think this is what's going, that went on here. If you read, but, uh, the, uh, read between the lines and compare Scripture with Scripture, uh, this is quite interesting. Daniel, as we pointed out, is in the middle of a great conflict between the angels of Satan and the angels of God because God was using him, quite frankly, as a buffer between the Jewish people and these heathen kings, Gentile kings, and he was using Daniel to communicate scripture. So, the chapter division, as we noted, of chapter 11, at this point in the book of Daniel, is uh, unfortunate. We noted that this uh, last evening. So the chapter division at this point in the book of Daniel is unfortunate because the statement here in Daniel 11.1 1 records the angel speaking about Michael and is connected to Daniel chapter 10 because it's connected to the statement about Michael and Daniel 10.21. So if you look at my, sta- uh, my uh, translation of Daniel chapter 10 verse 21, before we look at chapter 11 verse 1, it says in Daniel chapter 10 verse 21, however I must cause what is recorded in the scripture, which is truth, to be revealed to you, Daniel, the angel says, even though no one stands firmly with, firmly with me against these, these fallen angels, the, the, the ruler over Persia, and the kings are ruling over Persia, except Michael, your ruler. Now, Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, if you read my translation of Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, just as I myself, during Darius the Mede's first year, presented myself for the purpose of being of assistance, as well as for the purpose of being a defense for him. Now, as as I'll mention this as we go through the evening. This is a very difficult verse to interpret. It's, uh, it's caused a lot of expositors some trouble. And in fact, the chapter itself is, in the Hebrew, the grammar and the syntax at times can be very difficult. But uh, if, uh, I think you'll, uh, as we go through it, I think I'll uh, have brought it, uh, my prayer is that God had guided me in, in presenting it as, as close to the original as we have. And uh, we see that uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 is, if you read my translation, it's a comparative clause. So if, if you look at uh, Daniel 11, 1, and I'm reading for the New American Standard at this point, <clears throat> it says, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. Now the Net Bible 
uh, which uh, I would recommend everybody to, to get uh, because of the, the, the translation in the notes. But it says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to strengthen him and to provide protection for him. Now, I'm not in agreement with that translation, but uh, I'm not in agreement with that translation, but um, it's, uh, I just wanted to read that to give you an, an alternative translation to the New American Standard. Because the New American Standard is more of a formal equivalence translation, and the Net Bible is a, li a, b a combination of formal equivalence, literal translation, and of course, dynamic equivalence. So, uh, this verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, is actually, if you compare the two statements, is a comparison between Michael providing support for this unidentified angel, speaking to Daniel while he fought against the angel of Satan who ruled Persia, and this same angel providing support for Michael while he he fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. Let me repeat that. Verse 1 is an apparent comparative clause, meaning it's comparing uh, the state. It's, uh, this verse presents a comparison between the, the previous statement in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21. Thus, this verse, Daniel 11, 1, presents a comparison between Michael providing support for this angel speaking to Daniel while he fought against the angel of Satan who ruled Persia, and this same angel providing support for Michael while he fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. Now, both the Net Bible and the, and I'll bring out this when I, when I go through the interpretation and the exegesis of it, the word for protection translated by the, Net, by the Net, New American Standard and the Net Bible, uh, I translate a bit differently, and I'll tell you why uh, when we get to it. I, pres I translate it defense or stronghold. Other translations do as well. Now, that's important because when I first look, because it, it, it's actually the translation here can be a stumble. That translation of this word here that's translated protection in the New American Standard, it actually, I believe, should be translated stronghold or defense. And one of the reasons why many people uh, uh, have a hard, uh, think that uh, uh, the hymn there at the end of verse 11 is Darius the Mede, and not uh, Michael the angel is because why would, the God, why would this angel protect Michael? Michael had just come to uh, help this angel. So Michael is stronger. So why would Michael need this angel's protection? That's important to uh, see there because many people translate the hymn at the end of the verse as referring to Darius the Mede. Not this, not Michael. So in other words, it says in the New American Standard, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. And a lot of people tr uh, interpret him as being Darius the Mede. I say it's Michael. And one of the reasons why people don't think it's Michael is because this word translated protection, if they translate it protection rather than defense or stronghold, it causes them to think that this can't be Michael here as being the him. Because why would this angel serve as protection for Michael when Michael had just come, as it says in verse 21 of chapter 10, to protect him or help him or aid him against the fallen angels of Satan? We'll go into this a little later too as well in, in even greater detail. So the very first statement, it's a, a very first prepositional phrase in verse 1. It says, in the first year Darius the Mede, that denotes that during the first year Darius the Mede's reign as king of Babylon, this, and how did he get to be king of Babylon? Cyrus the Persian, the head of the Medo persian Empire, who Daniel mentions in chapter 10, verse 1, he installed Darius the Mede as the, as the ruler over Babylon. Babylon was incorporated into the Medo persian Empire. Cyrus the Persian delegated authority to this Darius the Mede, as we saw in Daniel chapter 5, verse uh, 31 in Daniel chapter 6. So when it says in the first year Darius the Mede, that indicates that during the first year Darius the Mede's reign as king of Babylon, this unidentified elect angel speaking to Daniel provided defensive assistance for Michael while he fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. So this prepositional phrase is marking the time when this angel served as support, defensive, prote uh, defensive support for Michael. And so it's telling us that I, the angel saying, I served Michael, helped Michael out as defensive protection for him while he waged war against the kingdom of darkness. And I did this during the first year of Darius the Mede's reign. And what occurred in Darius the Mede's first reign was that Daniel was put to death. 
at, as a result of a conspiracy against him. So they, if you put two and two together, why would there have to be this? Why would this angel have to help Michael at this particular time during Darius the Mede's reign? Because Daniel was about to was going to be killed by these conspirators at the instigation of the kingdom of darkness. That's why, and that would have been bad news for the Jews. Because again, Daniel was a buffer between the pagan Gentile kings and the Jewish exiles in Babylon. Now, let's look at the next statement. It says, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. That's what the, the New American Standard says. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the Hebrew, we, only have, we have a little bit of Hebrew to look at here this evening. It's important because... Uh, there's, uh, it's, there's some translation issues and, and uh, that are, that are involved here. So I have to go give you some Hebrew to explain why I'm changing the translation and, and interpreting it a certain way. So first of all, when it says, I arose to be an encouragement, it starts off with the preposition le, which is prefixed to the infinitive construct form of the word ahmad, which is translated arose. And then this is followed by the first person singular pronominal suffix ani, which is not translated. And then once again, we have the preposition le, translated to. And then the phrase in encouragement is the participle form of the verb kazak. We've seen this word in the past. Now, Ahmad, translated arose, that means here to present oneself to a superior to serve them, to stand in front of a superior in order to offer them a service. Now, this indicates that this unidentified elect angel, speaking to Daniel, presented himself to his superior Michael in order to render assistance and to be a stronghold or a fortress for this archangel Michael as he fought the kingdom of darkness during Darius the Mede's first year. Now the first person singular pronominal suffix, ani, which the New American Standard doesn't translate, and the reason why it's very... It's hard to understand the, the syntax of the passage, how this word relates to the other words in the passage. It's very difficult. And, and so uh, what I see here is that this, this suffix here, ani, it means myself. It's functioning as a reflexive pronoun. And this would indicate that the angel, that, uh, the angel is presenting himself to Michael in the sense that he offered his services to Michael as he fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of Darius the Mede's reign. So I, the word that's uh, the pronominal suffix ani that's not translated by the New American Standard, I would translate it myself and translate Ahmad arose because it has that semantic range present. Now, what do I mean by semantic range? Don't get too intimidated or too screwed up. And if you don't understand, don't worry, ask me later or whatever. But it's, uh, uh, there are people that, that are interested in these things, and I also need to explain myself why I'm going to why I'm going to translate something different than your New American Standard translations. It has to be explained. There's no getting around it because we can't interpret the passage if we don't know the grammar and the syntax. So we see here that this word uh, has a semantic range, meaning there's different uh, mean a, a word can have like in English, the word run. Think of how many, look up your English dictionary sometime and look at Webster's and see how many different uh, way, uh, ways that the word run can, what it can mean. You can run for president. You can run down the street, right? There's different ways the word run is used. Gay, you could be gay, I'm, I'm homosexual, gay, I'm happy. So, and, there, and, and so there's different, what we call a, a semantic range of a word. A word by itself, and this is true of any language, a word by itself has no meaning. It has meaning, but by virtue of the words it's used in relation to. So gay means nothing until it's in a, in a, with other words, then we figure out, oh, this is the definition of the word. So a word, is, it's, its meaning is determined by the context in which it's found. So here, I would translate the phrase, I arose, I presented myself. He's talking about, I came to Michael and presented myself as an inferior to a, he's superior to me, he's a higher rank angel. I came to help him. I presented myself to him. Or in other words, sir, I've reported for duty. What do you need me to do? 
That's the idea here. Though, uh, now next, we have the word for encouragement here. This, is, this also has to be changed a little bit. The word kazak there, translated encouragement. In the Hebrew, it, can mean, it means here to be of help, uh, to be of assistance. And it refers to this angel speaking to Daniel as helping Michael as he fought against Satan's angels during the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Now, don't miss this. This same word, and this is telling us that verse 21 of chapter 10 and chapter 11, verse 1, it's, uh, the, this word appears in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21 as well. That's telling us there's a linkage between these two statements, chapter 10, verse 21, and chapter 11, verse 1, because they both use the same verb, so, and they both use the same way. So this same verb, kazakh, Translated encouragement in the New American Standard. Appeared in Daniel chapter 10 verse 21 where it was used of Michael standing firm or helping this angel speaking to Daniel when he fought the kingdom of darkness during the third year of the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So if you look at my translation of Daniel chapter 10 verse 21, I'll point out the word for you. However, he says, I must cause what is recorded in the scripture, which is truth, to be revealed to you, even though no one stands firmly with me against these except Michael, your ruler. Stands firmly, that's the word kazak there. So that word is used again in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. But this time, it's talking about this angel standing firm or helping Michael. Whereas in chapter 10, verse 21, it's of Michael helping this angel. So here in Daniel 11, 1, this word kazak denotes that this angel, speaking to Daniel, helped or rendered assistance to Michael as this archangel Michael fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of Darius the Mede. Now, here in Daniel 11, 1, the preposition, as I said before, is prefixed to the infinitive construct form of this verb kazak. That's a very, uh, that construction happens quite a bit in Hebrew. And it can have different meanings. And the way you figure out what's the, the, the way it's used, you compare the clauses, it, the sentence, it, you compare the word, uh, the, this prepositional phrase, and look at the way it's used in the sentence. And you compare what's come before it and what's going after it. You look at the word, and that's how you determine its function. Here, it's a marker of purpose, the preposition. So, it, uh, you could say, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose, or I presented myself, to, for the purpose, for the purpose of being of assistance, or of help. So, the New American Standard kind of has the idea, you can translate it that, and I, that would be uh, the expressing purpose there to translate it to be an encouragement, or to be a, of assistance, okay? That's a, an English phrase that talks to be something, or for the purpose of, or in order to, those phrases in English express purpose. So that's the idea here with this prepositional phrase. So it, this would indicate that this angel speaking to Daniel presented himself to Michael in order to, or for that purpose, of helping Michael as he fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Now, thank you for bearing with me. We have another uh, word I mentioned earlier in the evening, two words actually, that are very important to interpreting this passage, and it's very important we get the meaning of the word correctly, because it does, it is going to affect the way we interpret it, and I mentioned that earlier, and I'll mention it why uh, this is the case again. Now, the phrase, a protection for him, it's composed of the preposition le. It's prefixed to the absolute noun, ma'az, and this word is translated, ma'az, is translated protection. It has other meanings as well. And the meaning, it's the correct meaning, is you have to analyze the word in the sentence and come up with the best meaning you can, the most likely meaning. Now listen to me. There is sometimes a word, there are several meanings the word can have that would fit. Now you've got to come up, as this is how difficult it can be sometimes, is that you have to say, okay, what's the most likely one? You have to weigh evidence. You have to come up with evidence. Okay, this is what I think. What I do is, and this is what expositors do, I'll look at a passage or a word and try to determine its meaning. And so they could have sometimes three, four different meanings that would fit. But what's the most likely one? Well, then you have to weigh the evidence. So what you do is you try to build a case 
for each interpretation. And the one you have the best case for is the one you usually take, uh, aside with. And also, you also do, what you do is you get a good commentaries, technical commentaries, and this is for, for people who are into the original language. You look at the technical commentaries and see what other men of God have done throughout the centuries who've been guided by the Holy Spirit and have wrestled with the text and see what they say. And if your interpretation is way out there, what I usually do is start all over again. I, might, I probably made a mistake because I couldn't be the only one that's right and all these guys are wrong. You know, so you got to be careful. You can get arrogant very quick. So you have to be very humble and be very patient. And you have to be very, what's the word? Um, you have to be able to, uh, as an exp uh, expositor and going back to original language, you have to be someone who has, is uh, very patient and uh, is, not, um, is not afraid to do mundane research. Which, which appears to be mundane or very boring because that's when you learn a lot is when you go through the tedious process sometimes of finding out the meaning of words. So a protection for him. The word protection is ma'oz. And then we have the uh, following it is another prepositional phrase composed of the preposition la, translated for. And the word for him is the third person masculine singular pronominal suffix who. It's how it's pronounced in the Hebrew. Now, it's uh, translated correctly, that last prepositional phrase. The question is, who is him? <laughs> who is it? Is it Darius the Mede or is it Michael the elect angel? Now, the, one of the reasons why people think it's not Michael the elect angel, this word him, is because of the word protection. If you say it's, if this word ma'az means protection, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, that doesn't make sense if, 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 it's, if the word ma'az means protection then him can't possibly refer to Michael. And the reason why is because why would Michael be protected by this angel who's of a lower rank than him and less power than him? You see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. That's the first thing I said to myself. But when I looked at this word ma'az, it has many, it has a couple of other meanings and a couple of which, and, it's, and you see it in a lot of major translations, is the word stronghold or fortress. Or you could say a defensive protection a defensive support. That's the idea of this word here, I believe. That would indicate that who there, the pronominal suffix who, translated him, is a reference to Michael. Now, that's important. Now, you've got to add this all together. Remember, they both have the same verb, kazak, Daniel 10.21 and Daniel 11.1. 1. That tells us there's a, bit, there's a linkage between the two verses. So you add that piece of evidence, which is going to indicate that him here in verse 1 is, a rela is related to Michael. Because the angel is talking about his relationship to Michael, how Michael helped him and he helped Michael. So the him, I believe, has to be Michael. And there are other reasons why I believe it's Michael and not Darius the Mede. And let me tell you something. I wrestled with this text for a while. Um, this is the thing that most people don't understand unless they actually are involved in it. And uh, is that there are many times you spend a lot of hours and people don't even have any clue how many hours. And guys who, know, who do this understand what I'm talking about. Before you go before your congregation and teach this, as a pastor, you should wrestle with the text. If anybody tells you that they look at the thing and they just know it right off the bat and blah, 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 they're so full of baloney. You've got to learn the language. You know, you have to learn Hebrew and, and, and Greek, and you're always learning, and we're always learning new things about the original language. So nobody has full knowledge. Now, what you need to do is you wrestle with the tax, text. Some passages in the Bible are extremely difficult to interpret. So if you get confused or you don't understand a passage, join the club. Sometimes it takes many years to finally understand what a passage means. I could tell you, I could take you some passages in the Old Testament and the New, and I could show you three or four different interpretations, and they all would be, you know, sound good. And then there's some, you, you look at some of the commentators and you go, nobody knows what this means. <laughs> Somebody, you know, there's some things, I mean, people take guesses, and some guys come out and are dogmatic and say, this is what it means, but to explain it, you know, there's holes in their support for their interpretation. So what I'm telling you is, when I go through this, and I, and I, might, and I give you a little Hebrew tonight, all right, because I'm trying to explain to you why I'm changing the translation. That's important. You, you just can't sit there and go, just tell me what it is. I, you know, 
No, you need to understand what's being taught, why I'm changing it. And so when I do this, and then I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I wrestle with the text. So if I come to you and give you an interpretation of the passage, you can rest assured that I've gone through as the best I could and looking at this passage and weighing the, the, the interpretive options that you might ha- I might have in the, ver- in the passage. And then I have to go and explain it to you. Now, sometimes I blow it. I listen to co- playback sometimes and go, you know, I could have done this differently. And you get better, hopefully, as you get older. Hopefully, I've gotten better. But there's some things... It's hard, I mean, it's hard to interpret and then try to explain it to somebody. That's when you know that you understand the passage when you can explain it to somebody. Now, somebody might not understand it because they don't have enough knowledge to understand the explanation yet. And at some point, maybe they will. And they'll look back years later and go, oh, that was, you explained that good. But at the time, I didn't know enough. So that's natural. So if there's some things that you hear t- taught from this pulpit and you don't understand, don't freak out and, and you know, don't freak out and, 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 uh, and get discouraged. Everybody has things that they don't understand in the Bible. But we do, there are things that we do know and we, we can be dogmatic on, you know, with, to get justified, saved, is faith alone and Christ alone. We need to confess our sins. That's all over the Bible. D- Jesus is God. Jesus rose from the dead. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are things that the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith we're sure on. But when we come to interpreting the Bible, some passages are more difficult than others. So what I'm trying, also trying to tell you here is be, uh, be patient with me as I go through this chapter because there's a lot of difficult, there's some difficult things, and there's not a lot of times I'm going to have to go back to the Hebrew. Sometimes the, the passage is very well translated and they do a great job. But when I have to go back... Be patient with me because I'm trying to tell you what the Holy Spirit, Spirit said in the original language. And if the, I believe that the New American Standard, based upon my knowledge of the original language, the New American Standard or any English translation doesn't have it right, I have a responsibility to tell you what it does say as I understand it because that's the Holy, if I'm right, that's the Holy Spirit speaking. So the Holy Spirit didn't inspire the New American Standard or the King James, or any English translation, or any translation in the history of the world. In fact, you know what they say about, there's a great, uh, I think it's an Italian proverb, uh, that they say translators, they're traitors. You know why they say that? Because translations, translators, a translator came up with that I, a statement. Translators are traitors. You know why? Because you never really get in your translation uh, the exact idiom that was in the, in the original text. Doesn't matter what language you're talking about. Some, the, to say some things that are in the Hebrew or the Greek, I can't, ac- I can't actually totally give you an English statement that w- reflects it accurately. So it's, it, sometimes it, there's things that have to uh, take a lot of explanation here. So this word, getting back to the text here, and thank you for letting me uh, go through, uh, present to you why um, I'm going through the Hebrew and why I do what I do. This word ma'az, translated protection, I actually render it uh, as a, a meaning a defensive, um, a, defen- a, a, a defense, we could just translate it, or a stronghold or a fortress. Those are all words, the, the way the word can be used, not just protection. So ma'az, I believe, and it should be translated a defense, and because the angel is speaking to Daniel, the angel that was speaking to Daniel, took up a defensive position while Michael took an offensive position against the enemy. Michael was this angel's superior, not only in rank, but also in power and ability, as we pointed out. Thus, this angel was not protecting Michael, but rather rendering him assistance by becoming a defense or a stronghold who would not give ground to the enemy. In other words, this angel probably came along and said, what do you want me to do, Michael? He says, watch my flank. You know, don't let me get hit from behind. You know, watch my flank. I'm gonna. T- I want to make a, a move on these guys, so you cover my flank. You know, it's it's kind of like uh, the football, uh, the quarterback. You know, you know the the left tackle. If he's a right, if a right-handed thrower, his blind side, he can't see behind him. He has. He doesn't have eyes behind his head. So the left tackle is very important to a quarterback because if the left tackle doesn't do his job, he's gonna get hurt or knocked out or something. So the left tackle, a lot of times, if he gets beat. He will yell to the quarterback, look out. They'll do that. And the quarterback will duck out of the play or just go down so he doesn't get killed. So he can play and make the next play. But 
he, the left tackle on a football team is protecting the right-handed throwing quarterback. All right? It's protecting his blind side. So I believe the angel, the angel speaking to Daniel's hands, and uh, Daniel is, uh, the angel speaking to Daniel here, is saying that, that I helped Michael out. I was a defense for him while he was waging offensive uh, attacks against the enemy. So, the preposition le, that's prefixed to this noun, this, it's in the absolute form, ma'az. It's, the preposition is functioning as a marker of purpose, indicating the purpose for which this angel speaking to Daniel presented himself to Michael. This angel speaking to Daniel presented himself to Michael in order to be a defense in spiritual combat while this archangel fought the kingdom of darkness during the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Now, the third person masculine singular pronominal suffix, who? The very last word, him, in the text, that's referring to Michael, as I pointed out. And it's the object of the preposition le, which is a marker of advantage. That would indicate that this angel presented himself to Michael for the purpose of helping him in combat, as well as to be a defense for the benefit of Michael. A marker of advantage means for your benefit, on your behalf. That's how you would express a marker of advantage in, in, in Greek and Hebrew and English. A marker of disadvantage means against, or a marker of opposition, against, or to the detriment of, not for your benefit. That's the idea with a marker of disadvantage. That's how you would express it in English. So let me give you the translation now. And now, now what I did, you've got to understand, what I did, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm not boasting, and I'm not bragging here, so make, make it clear. I'm bemoaning the fact that most men don't, a lot of men don't do this anymore. Some do. I just went to the text. Now, look, I told you the English translations are not inspired by God. Now, if I know that a text means this and they're wrong, and you might think I'm wrong because if I give you my evidence, you might say, oh, I think you're wrong. Well, you'd have to know some Hebrew or Greek to, 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 to really to, uh, to de um, debunk my interpretation. But listen to me. Uh, if I don't tell you what the original says, and that's my job to go back and tell you what the original text says, because that's the ins inspired language. If I don't do that, and I, and I just go with the translation, and the translation is way off, then I'm not doing my job. Now, sometimes, a lot of times, majority of the time, the English translations, they're pretty right on, and a lot of times, all I need to do is, is um, give you the statement in the, in the translation, and it, I could tell you, give you more details of what it's saying. And sometimes the translation don't give um, all the details that I will give you. But I will give you those details, whatever's lacking in the translation. Okay? Now, sometimes when something's drastically off, and it's, very, it's usually because the, the passage is very difficult to translate or interpret, I will go back and, and go through this. Now, listen to me. Once we've done that, once we figured out what the text says, now we can interpret it. Now, we can't interpret something if we don't know what it says. So that's why you have to bear with me sometimes when I do this. And it doesn't happen that often, as I said. But when it does happen, don't uh, please be patient with me and let me explain myself. And if you don't understand all of that's been said, don't, you know, don't freak out. But I don't want you to sit there. I could go do this. I could go and give you the translation, then tell you, uh, tell you the text, uh, what I think the text says, and then it might not correspond to what you're reading. And you're going to sit there and go, uh, okay, why, it doesn't say, that's not what my t passage says. So now I have to go back and do, uh, go right back to it again. Now I have to go explain myself. So instead of going and explaining myself later, I'm explaining myself now the way I should, and, and then give you my translation. Now we know what it says. Now what does that mean? And then what, is it, what did it mean to the original audience? Who, whoever wrote, read, you know, the Jews who read this first, uh, when they got it and Daniel got this information, how do they understand it? Then, once we know what that is, the author's intent, now I got to tell you what the, what the, how it applies to us. So there's a process that goes involved in this. So the most difficult process where you have to do a lot of thinking is this one we're trying to figure out what the text is actually saying. Once we know what the text says, what the, the, the words and the statements are, okay, what do these words and statements mean? All right, so it's a process. Find out what the statements are in the, in the passage. What do they mean? What do the words in the text mean? Then once I know what the words in the text mean, then what, the word, how, what is that saying? What does it mean to the audience who got this? 
And then how does it apply to us? So Daniel, uh, if we could read Daniel 10, 21 with Daniel 11, 1, that's the way we should read these two states. We should read Daniel 11, 1 with Daniel 10, 21, because they go together. So it says in Daniel 10, 21, my translation, however, I must cause what is recorded in the scripture, which is truth, to be revealed to you, Daniel, even though no one stands firmly with, with me against these, except Michael, your ruler. And these is referring to the fallen angels. Then verse 1 of chapter 11. Just as I myself, during Darius the Mede's first year, presented myself for the purpose of being of assistance, as well as for the purpose of being a defense for him. So he's saying, I assisted Michael, and Michael has assisted me. Michael came to assist me during the third year of Cyrus the Persian's reign, and I, I, years before, a couple of years before, I assisted him during the first year of Darius the Mede's reign. And Darius, the first year of Darius Mede's reign is quite tumultuous. If we read Daniel chapter 6, it gives us information as to why Michael and the elect angels were busy fighting off Satan and the fallen angels. Because Satan and the fallen angels were actually trying to destroy Daniel, and they almost did, but God intervened. So Daniel 11.1 1 is a comparative clause, as I mentioned in the beginning, which draws a comparison with the previous statement in Daniel 10.21, which records the unidentified elect angel telling Daniel that Michael was the only elect angel who stood firm in combat with him while he fought the angel of Satan who ruled Persia. So the angel is telling Daniel that just as Michael came to his aid when he fought the kingdom of darkness during the third year of Cyrus the Persian, so he rendered assistance to Michael during, the, during Darius the Medes' first year. Now, as I also mentioned, Bible expositors of this verse are not in agreement to the identity of the, the third person masculine singular pronominal suffix who translated him at the end of verse 1. And since, and the reason why is that some argue that Darius the Mede is in view here. I say it's Michael. So this, this would indicate that this angel speaking to Daniel rendered assistance and protection for this king from the kingdom of darkness during his first year. Let me repeat that. If him here is Darius the Mede, which many say, and I used to think so too, but I've since changed, this would indicate that this angel speaking to Daniel helped or rendered assistance or protection for this king from the kingdom of darkness during his first year. However, if you look at the context, it makes no sense whatsoever for the angel speaking to Daniel to interject here at this point in the story as helping Darius during his first year. Why? Because this king is not mentioned in, verse, in the previous verses or the verses to follow. He's only mentioned here, as I said before, to mark time when this angel helped Michael. In the first year Darius the Medes reign, that's selling, it's not just talking about, it's talking about when this all transpired that this angel helped Michael. So it's not Darius the Mede, because the context, he's, never, he's nowhere found. But who's found in context? Him's got to be Michael, because Michael's mentioned in the previous context. The only reason that the angel mentions Darius the Mede is to use the first year of this king's reign to mark the time when this angel helped Michael fight the kingdom of darkness. So, though it makes sense that this angel would help Darius, because he was a believer, as we saw, there's nothing in the context, however, which would indicate that this king is being referred to by the third person, masculine singular, pronominal suffix, who, which is translated him. So by interpreting this pronominal suffix, who, which is translated him, by interpreting it as referring to Michael, it fits the context because the angels just finished talking about Michael in Daniel 10.21. Michael is the only person who this angel could be speaking about. So again, why isn't Darius the Mede him here in verse 1? Well, he's not mentioned in, in chapter 10. He's not mentioned in the rest of chapter 11. Heck, he's not mentioned in chapter 12. But Michael's mentioned in Daniel 10, 21. Then why? Well, that, a lot of people say, well, it says in the first year of Darius the Mede's reign. Yeah, but, but that prepositional phrase is simply telling us, the reader, when this all took place, that this angel helped him, who we say is Michael. 
So the only reason why Darius the Mede's name is mentioned here is because to mark time with the first year of his reign. Are you following me? So Michael is the only person who could be, that, that the angel could be speaking about here. The only, and let me give you the, uh, the, uh, the arguments against my interpretation. The only legitimate argument against this interpretation or a possible stumbling block to accepting this interpretation is the meaning of the word ma'az, translated protection by the New American Standard. Uh, I say it means defense. Because this word can have different meaning. It can mean protection. It can have strong, the word uh, meaning stronghold, or fortress, or defense. It can have all those meanings in the Old Testament. Now, it could be argued that this angel couldn't have offered Michael protection because Michael was more powerful than this angel speaking to Daniel and had helped this angel fight the prince of Persia. However, as I also mentioned, this noun ma'az can mean fortress or stronghold, which would indicate that the angel was a stronghold or a fortress for Michael in the sense that he held a defensive position against the enemy and did not give up any ground. I explained that earlier in the evening as well. So therefore... What we have here is in Daniel 11.1 1, is a comparative clause indicating a comparison between Michael providing support for this angel speaking to Daniel while he fought against the angel of Satan who ruled Persia and this same angel providing support for Michael while he fought Satan's angels during Darius the Mede's first year. In other words, this angel speaking to Daniel is informing him that by Michael coming to his aid or to, uh, to help him fight the angel of Satan who ruled Persia during the third year of Cyrus the Persian's reign, the archangel was reciprocating since he helped Michael fight Satan's angels during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. So we say the, the angel has just said that uh, he, Michael had come to help him. Daniel 10.21 Michael came to help him out. Daniel 11.1, 1, the angel said, I came to help Michael out in the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. He helped me in the third year of Cyrus the Persian's reign. Okay? So Daniel 11.1, 1, now what is this telling us? What is the text telling us? And, and the other thing is, why does, why does this angel, why did, there's a couple of questions we need to ask ourselves. One, obviously, what is the, what is the, the angel trying to tell us? about the angels, okay? And the other thing is, why would this angel have to help Michael during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign? What took place during Darius, the first year of Darius the Medes' reign that would uh, prompt Michael and the elect angels to come and fight the kingdom of darkness? What was going on? All right? So those are some of the, couple, some of the questions we need to ask now we know what this text is, uh, the, what, the, uh, what the original audience would understand this uh, verse to mean. So Daniel 11.1 1 would reveal that the elect angels help each other, quite frankly, even though one elect angel might be superior in rank to another, as is the case of this angel speaking to Daniel and Michael. So in other words, it dep doesn't matter your rank. If a higher rank of angel, more powerful angel like Michael, needs your assistance, the elect angels go to help, just like Michael would come to help them. So they're working in concert together to fight the kingdom of darkness on behalf of God. I wonder, and here's something to think about, you th think about this seriously. And you said this is now a little bit of you know, speculation or thinking about the fallen angels. Knowing the fallen angels, how corrupted they are, right? Do you really think that they always get, do you think they always, they don't have little fights with themselves? Have you ever thought about that? If they're so, if they're so, they're an unregenerate state, they're not holy angels, they're going to be, the fallen angels are going to be in this state for all of eternity, and so they're, 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 um, they're, they're characterized by evil, they're inherently evil, all right? Well, what's to say that they don't fight it amongst themselves? I don't know. I've thought about that. You know, they have, I mean, I'm sure they're united in fighting against God's angels, but this text saying that the elect angels of God, whoever needs the help, doesn't matter who he is, we run. We're there. They fight together. 
There's no, oh, I'm too big. There's no, I'm too big for my own britches, you know. Michael can't say, well, you know, I don't, I'm not going to help this guy, you know. No, they all help each other. They're all united in fighting against the kingdom of darkness. Or in other words, they're all united in fighting for the cause of God, trying to establish his kingdom on the earth. See, this is what's going on, people. God's trying to establish his kingdom on this earth. And right now, there's a war to get that accomplished. And Satan's going to lose that battle. In fact, in the midway point of the tribulation period, who's throwing Satan and the angel, fallen angels out of heaven? Michael, leading the elect angels of God. There's going to be war in heaven. So the kingdom of God is, we're, we're, actually, we're actually behind enemy lines. You ever see that movie, Behind Enemy Lines? We are actually behind enemy lines. Because Satan's kingdom is on the earth, and we're in the middle of it. And God's kingdom is not in, in governmental form, in bodily form. It's in, some, it's in the church. The kingdom of God manifests itself through the character of the church, the godly character of the church. Paul says that in Romans 14, 17. But far as the bodily governmental form of Jesus Christ on the earth, it hasn't been established here yet on earth. So in, in other words, we're behind, God has got us behind enemy lines, behind Satan's lines. So the war is coming to this earth. And this war is going to end on this earth. This is going to be the final. This is going to be Waterloo for the Satan and the fallen angels. This will be the final battleground for them, this earth. So the elect angels are united in fighting against the angels of Satan. This is what this text is telling us. Now, here's, I mentioned this earlier. The question arises, and I think this is, more, this is uh, quite interesting. And it talks about Satan's persecution of Israel. The question arises as to why this angel speaking to Daniel would have to render, render assistance to Michael during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. Let me repeat that. The question arises as to why this angel speaking to Daniel would have to render assistance to Michael during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign. What was going on during that year? Well, as I said earlier, chapter 6 of the book of Daniel kind of gives us an information. Michael was, uh, Daniel was under attack. Daniel was actually executed. Something was definitely going on in the first year of Darius, Darius the Medes' reign. So what took place during the first year of this king's reign, which would suggest that what would, what would have taken place that during the first year of Darius the Medes' reign, which would suggest that Michael would have needed assistance from this angel speaking to Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 gives us the answer. As we saw, there was a conspiracy to kill Daniel during Darius' first year. Darius was deceived, as we read, by his governmental officials who served with, Daniel into, uh, uh, served with Daniel into issuing an order forbidding anyone in Darius' kingdom to pray to his God. Of course, these officials knew Daniel would remain loyal to his God and continue to pray, thus putting him under the sentence of death. The motivation for the conspiracy was jealousy, as we saw. Because Darius, as you recall, was so impressed with Daniel's talents, abilities, and wisdom that he was going to put Daniel in authority over everybody, including his fellow satraps. So both Daniel and Darius were under attack from the kingdom of darkness, who prompted these government officials to deceive Darius into issuing the order. Don't be foolish. The Bible's telling Daniel was, be and Darius, because they're both believers, Darius was deceived in issuing this edict, again, again, forbidding prayer to, their, to anyone's God during a month period. Darius didn't want to do that. When he found out, he was totally flabbergasted and totally horrified that he signed this edict, that he was deceived by these guys. And we saw that Darius had faith in Daniel's God because he went, to the, he went to the lion's dead the next morning and if he thought Daniel was dead and God didn't deliver him, he wouldn't have shown up at the lion's den. But he did, thus expressing his confidence that God could deliver him, his faith in God. So uh, Darius and Daniel were both under attack from the kingdom of darkness and the question arises as to why. Who's head of, over Babylon? Darius. What is Daniel doing there? Daniel's a buffer between Darius and the, and the Medo-Persian Empire and the Jewish exiles in Babylon. Satan was trying to wipe out the Jews in Babylon before God got them, uh, you know, let them go back to uh, Israel. And the first step in doing that was killing Daniel and then getting rid of Darius. 
But they, 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 they figured, well, we, we can get rid of Daniel by doing this. So they're the ones that were behind uh, the, the, the conspiracy. Satan is the author of conspiracy. He's the one who performed the first coup d'etat, which was put down by God. He's the author of conspiracy, and, he, and they did this against Jesus. Who was behind Judas Iscariot and the Pharisees against Jesus and the Sadducees and the scribes? Satan. So Satan, though his name's not mentioned explicitly here, his kingdom is waging war during the, against Daniel and Darius and God's people, the Jews, in the 6th century B.C., and the first year Darius the Medes reign. That's why Michael needed help. Because he's trying to help the Jewish people and Daniel at that time. And Daniel had no clue that he had this kind of angelic support around him. So, by God delivering Daniel from death, he also delivered Darius from executing an innocent man. Darius' subsequent decree, praising God for delivering Daniel, would serve as a protection to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. Remember that? After he delivered Daniel, after God delivered Daniel, Darius puts out a decree praising the God of Israel. He puts the death of conspirators and their families. And that decree would serve to protect the Jews in Babylon for the rest of the time in Babylon, which wouldn't be much longer. So that's great because this is what was going on behind the scenes. Satan was going uh, after using Daniel's fellow satraps to, and he was using them to try to kill Daniel. They actually succeeded, but God intervened and delivered Daniel. And taking Daniel out would have been terrible for the Jewish people because he was a buffer between the kings of the world at that time who had authority over the Jews in Babylon. He was the buffer between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, guys like that, and evil Merodach, as we saw in the past. Daniel was the guy who was the buffer. And so Daniel was out of the way. Kingdom of Darkness figured, we got him. We got the Jews now. There's nobody, nobody, there to protect, nobody there to stand the gap there. So this is why the angel had to go and, had to go and help Michael. So thus the, we see that Darius' subsequent decree, praising God for delivering Daniel, served as a protection to the Jewish exiles in Babylon, thus uh, thwarting, stopping Satan's attempt to destroy the Jews in Babylon. Why was he trying to do that? Well, they're on the other side of the cross in Daniel's day. The Son of God had not become a man. The Son of God came to what? Save us sinners. To die for the sins of the world and to destroy the works of the devil. No wonder Satan didn't want Jesus. So if he wipes out the Jews, then God's prediction that the Messiah will come through the Jews won't be able to come to pass. Now, we're on the other side of the cross. What's the purpose to try to wipe out the Jews now? So Christ can't have his millennial reign over the Jews. With the, the Israel is the head of the nations. And thus God, the, proving that God is not faithful or is not powerful enough to come th uh, through on his promises to Israel. Of course, he's gonna be Satan's going to be stopped there too. So as we close, and you've been a great audience this evening. Therefore in Daniel 11.1, 1, Michael and the angel speaking to Daniel, who communicated the revelation which appears in Daniel chapter 11 verse 2 to the end of the book, were engaged in spiritual combat with the angel of Satan who ruled Persia, who was attempting to have Daniel killed and the Jews in Babylon exterminated. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard and encourage us, that you are in control, that you are sovereign over the nations, and that you are a sovereign over our lives and you're a protection and you uh, dispatch the elect angels to, to protect us from the attacks of the kingdom of darkness. And we thank you, Father, for doing that, just like you did for Daniel back in his day and the Jews. We thank you for doing us for that for us in the church. We thank you for your word which uh, shows us that you're going to rule this earth through, through your son Jesus Christ and we just thank you for the fact that you've given us the victory over sin and Satan through our, the death and resurrection of your son so Father we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name Amen